Now here's a shot we made later to illustrate to Bell engineers what was involved inside the helicopter. And it shows parts of the transmission in the very first machine. This is the free wheeling, which uh, those of you who know Model 47 will recognize right away, except that instead of 16 slots, we later had to go to 32 slots for those rollers. Now, Arthur had thought that Bell would be able to provide him with transmission designers who would know far more than he did. But uh, to his surprise, uh, they, Bell was unable to help at all with the transmission, so Arthur merely made a, a copy of his same transmissions he'd used in the little models. But this is six times larger in size, otherwise almost identical to the model techniques. The transmission is a double planetary with free floating pinions. Here the uh, freewheeling is almost assembled, and as you see, it is the ring gear for one of the stages of the double planetary so that in one direction it was perfectly free and in the other direction it would lock up, similar to the coaster brake on a bicycle. Now here are the two planetary stages. The one on top happens to be the lower one at, lower, at higher RPM and lower torque, and the uh, bigger pinions on the bottom of the upper stage driving the mast. <coughs> now every new uh, project, of course, has to have a ceremony of rollout with dignitaries, and we had to have ours. So uh, came the day exactly six months after we got to Gardenville that we had what we called our official rollout. And the girl on the left there is going to try to break the champagne. The second try, she makes it, and we're ready for the big moment. Those two landing gear legs have been put on after the nose got out the door because they're much too wide for the door. We managed to get it out, but uh, we were unable to start the engine, and so ignominiously it had to be towed back by my car into the uh, garage. You can see we had pretty good winters in Buffalo even back then. This is December 18th, just over a year after we got to Bell, and six months after this project in the garage was started. Now here's a, a later rollout and we've learned the drill of how to put the legs on much better at this point. The garage is still a Chrysler agency. Uh, it was restored to its original purpose after the Gardenville project was finished. The Gardenville project lasted exactly three years from June of 1942 to June of 1945. The agreement that Arthur had with Larry Bell was to uh, make a one-place helicopter to demonstrate the principles, and then later to make a two-place helicopter so Larry himself could get a ride. Uh, details of the landing gear are rather amusing here. You notice the black tube at the bottom there is a tension member, and then outboard there is shock cord so that we get a resilient effect. You can see the fuselage is hardly completed, but there is a wooden bench for the pilot operator to sit on, and uh, the object here, of course, was just to get the engine uh, running with the rotor and make sure we had a compatible mechanism without large oscillations. That's just the dolly that wheels, we wheeled it in and out on, and uh, there's a pretty good view of the test bed uh, in the configuration where we got the first mechanical problems uh, solved. That shows how the rotor is free to move in a seesaw direction. Uh, here's our auxiliary power cart, the mighty APU, consisting of two batteries in series. And by this means, we managed to give the uh, rotor engine enough of a kick to start. Now, we had no clutch at this point, but uh, we could rotate the rotor ahead of time on the free wheeling, which we did so that there was possibility that the poor engine could get started without all the inertia of the rotor. Nobody in the cockpit, you notice, uh, not exactly recommended these days, but uh, you can see uh, that we're trying to 
uh, work on getting the mechanism to run properly. We had a lot of trouble with the carburetor and torsional oscillations at first. Now here Arthur Young's trying his own helicopter, uh, sitting in the, uh, on that bench and uh, testing out the controls to see if their sensitivity is about right and so forth. We're holding him by ropes, again attached above the center of gravity, to prevent him from sliding and slithering around too much. But uh, he wanted to see, of course, right away whether we had about the right uh, power, right uh, uh, control sensitivity, and so forth. Now that's just to illustrate the amount of wind in this case, because our first problem immediately encountered was uh, very severe vibrations whenever he was hovering in a breeze of about 20 knots or so. We always said he flew about three feet up here, but he never quite got that fourth foot off the ground. About this time, we had our first setback. We had a visit from a Bell executive who was a pilot who felt that he should be the one to make the first flight. And so uh, he came to join us one day near New Year's uh, of 43. And here he is without his safety belt fastened, and he's holding on by means of the controls. Now watch very closely because we're going to have our first uh, bad uh, episode here. He's thrown up through the rotor. He landed in a snowbank to the left there, and fortunately his injuries were limited to a broken left arm just above the wrist. In fact, in a matter of only days, he was able to go about his uh, business. But uh, we were set back considerably and took us a little while to rebuild our test bed. Here it is rebuilt. Notice that the engine is uh, flexibly mounted in the pylon there and that it's a vertical installation very similar to where the electric motors for the models had been, right in the center with the shaft vertical, which was part of our development problem I referred to earlier. This shows a little bit later in spring and Arthur Young will show the throttle in his right hand as he twists it, and the uh, lever in his left hand is known as the pump handle collective. We'll explain more about that later. Now here he is running a test in the yard, and he is uh, showing, uh, he's tethered to the ground in the first place here, and I think you can see to the left of the machine along the fence there uh, a cable. That cable is holding the machine. We do not have the beautiful, shiny tail boom anymore here because, of course, we lost it in the wreck. But here we have a uh, welded structure instead of a tail boom, and the back end of it uh, uh, is attached by a cable to the man over by the fence holding that dial there. There uh, you can see the uh, method of measuring the torque. And since we know the force there, and hence the torque, we know the RPM. We therefore know the power very exactly. The engine is a 165 horsepower, six-cylinder opposed Franklin. And much to their embarrassment, we were always able to check up on the power output of the engine. At the same time, we wanted to know about our lift, because all our calculations on the performance had been extrapolations from model data. So. Uh, Naturally, we were anxious as early as possible to find out how we were doing. The Arthur had learned to uh, measure uh, performance of models in a hover very accurately and beautifully with apparatus that he had developed. Uh, and he tried a tremendous variety of airfoils and uh, combinations of RPM, solidity, and so forth. But uh, nevertheless, extrapolating to full-scale Reynolds numbers, we were very anxious to, to double-check. And incidentally, we had built two different transmission ratios. One was 9 to 1, and the other one was 10.5 to 1. Here is the Chatelon scale, which is measuring the uh, uh, excess thrust. Now, we move a month or two later to uh, May of 1943, and the pilot is no longer Arthur here. This is Floyd Carlson. He was a young man who had been hired as a test pilot for Bell's fighter planes and uh, had been assigned to the project even before we got to 
Gardenville, uh, or at least shortly after we got to Gardenville, I guess. Uh, Floyd immediately learned how to hover as soon as he tried here. And uh, you can see that we have excellent hovering stability. He is tied with the cable to the ground, and you can see the trapeze there attached to outriggers above the center of gravity. But uh, uh, even though he's able to fly the machine so well, Arthur didn't want to let him fly free yet. Perhaps because of our accident, uh, he felt very conservative and wanted to be absolutely sure before Floyd could fly in the sense of going from one place to another without that cable underneath him. Here, Floyd's going to do the uh, first 360 degree hovering turn while uh, Arthur watches from the ground. This uh, control system I'll tell you a little more about now. Floyd's left hand there is on the pump handle collective. He has no rudder pedals. His uh, left hand, when it moves horizontally, controls the pitch of the tail rotor and hence the direction of the machine whereas up and down was collective pitch of the main rotor. His uh, throttle is on the cyclic pitch in his right hand. Now we have a shot from the roof of the, of the garage, and you see that he's about out of uh, ground effect. He's going to be able to wave at us a little later uh, because the collective pitch forces are balanced. Now we tried many different control systems, at least a half a dozen, uh, but this particular one is the one that uh, was used at first for all the free flights and uh, uh, six of us learned to fly this machine by this tether technique with no rudder pedals. He's going to wave at us there and he gets the machine pretty well buttoned up right after that. Now here is a scene very reminiscent of that model scene where Arthur tried to shake the model by shoving its legs and sure enough of course full scale is uh, equally uh, solid. Uh, it turned out later we almost had too much hovering stability, but this uh, certainly was spectacular and very nice at this point, especially uh, since Floyd had to learn on his own hook uh, what the characteristics of the machine were. Uh, it was very nice to have it respond so slowly. Now we're going to see the uh, more details of the actual structure that was used on ship one. This project w was known as the Gardenville project and the helicopter was known as Model 30. Now there's our first rotor break. You can see that spring is really here. We're in June of 1943. Notice as he pulls the uh, uh, pitch up and down that the stabilizer bar itself moves up and down. Uh, it's driven by a separate outer tube uh, from below because the rotor is clamped to the mast. The device, which you can just barely see through the bar there, is an enormous clamp uh, so that the mast did not have any splines or stress razors. The only way we drove it by the transmission was a brazed piece at the bottom which uh, had splines on it. In this way, we felt that we had a reliable structure with un uninterrupted uh, path for the large force of torque. There's the cyclic pitch, which is very conventional. Inside the bar are mixing levers here because uh, we do not have the flywheel, of course, and so our Art had no way of controlling the helicopter by pilot motion unless he introduced levers inside the bar. They're called mixing levers. At the time we called it the fixed stick control. And in that way, uh, that was the first major uh, invention that had to be added before, uh, after we got to Gardenville and before free flights could be made. 